really step down. If, I, do, I do believe not, not step down in the sense that he's resigning like Richard Nixon did in August of 1974, but more like Lyndon Johnson in March of 1968, basically saying, I'm going to pass the baton on to a new generation of Republicans, and I've done this amazing thing for the country, and I've X, Y, Z, and I'm And who would be the new generation? Nikki Haley? So yeah, it would be people like Nikki Haley, uh, Mike Pence. Pence. I think uh, Mike Pompeo is going to run for the Senate. That would take him out of that position. But there's a there's a group of uh, Republican senators and Republican governors that would probably be in that position. Um, but I think that. Uh, I think that that could happen. I, I, I very much so think that that could happen. I said in August, uh, before we're around the eve of impeachment, but on August 8th, and I can tell people why I broke from the president, I went on CNN and said, I have to disavow my support for him. There's something clearly wrong, uh, and uh, it's Trump Noble. I don't know if you saw the HBO series Chernobyl, but we're in the second episode. The reactor has melted down. And now the Russian bureaucrats, the apparatchiks, are trying to figure out if they're going to cover it up or are they going to clean it up? What are they going to do? And I said the Republicans would start out by cleaning it up, but at the end of the day, they, they, they I'm sorry, covering it up, but at the end of the day, they'd end up cleaning it up. I got that wrong. I'm very surprised by the lack of principles and the lack of courage in the Republican Senate. I'm very surprised. But John Kennedy, he wrote three books. He wrote A Nation of Immigrants. He wrote Why England Slept, and he wrote Profiles and Courage, which he won the Pulitzer Prize for. He said his last book, Profiles and Courage, was his thinnest book because there's no courage out there. And so you're seeing that right now as anybody that really understands the American Constitution and understands what the president is doing with the presidency would reject that and seek his removal. But now I recognize that partisanship and personal preservation are now important, more important than patriotism. And just think about what we've lost from the generation that fought the Second World War into the baby boomers. Just, I just want to think about the magnitude of the integrity and the principles that we've lost in a very short period of time. Uh, and so they'll likely leave him in office. And you're right, he's a resilient guy. Maybe I'm wrong, the poll numbers stay at 40, and, and he works a path back to reelection. Let's just remember how he's got to win it. He's got to win it in 11 states approximately 15 to 18 percent of the registered voters. If you live in New York, your vote doesn't count. If you live in California, I'm sorry to tell you, it doesn't count. Those states are overwhelmingly blue. There are 11 states that he has to win, the four major ones being Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Florida. I predict that he will win Florida. Uh, I predict that he'll win Ohio. That's good for him because Ohio how it goes Ohio usually goes yeah, every president won Ohio. Yeah. The nation. Okay, so those are good factors for him. But he then has to win two of those other three states. Because of the way this works from the Electoral College point of view and our demography, our demography is mostly sitting on the coast. And so he has a chance to win re-election. He could theoretically, and they've modeled this, he could lose the popular vote by seven million votes and still win the Electoral College with a certain matrix up through the middle of those independent states. So I predict that that will not happen. He'll get destroyed in those states. Let's talk about it then. And I can speak that to you economically because those states are suffering. And there will be people like me that are very well organized that will be out there. I do two swing states a week. And I'm out there speaking to people. And I'm primarily speaking to moms. I go into areas where it's a, it's a student teacher association and things like that where I speak to moms about the travesty of this presidency and the ridiculous nature of the bullying. And I remind people of Umberto Eco, uh, the checklist of fascism. Uh, the president on that 10-point checklist is at seven of those. Uh, but the one that is particularly disturbing to moms, to American women, is the bullying. Uh, and he's literally using the bully pulpit of the presidency to attack individual citizens, and he's doing it now with much higher frequency. And I think that it is very, very disturbing to people. And I'll remind people in this room what Abraham Lincoln said to, uh, to Douglas during one of the debates. Douglas was challenging the intellect of the American people, and uh, often politicians will make that mistake of challenging the intellect of the hordes of American people. And Lincoln turned to Douglas and 1856, and he said, well, you know, you may think that, but the American people have a, a good nose. 
and they can smell a rotting cadaver in their basement. And Trump represents that rotting cadaver. And so, yes, there's a 35, 40% of those people that will stay with them. They're longing for something that never existed in America. It was primarily a white America. It's a hagiography into a Norman Rockwellian America. Those are the people that are buying catheters off of Fox News. It's an aging demographic. Uh, and But I do think that people be beaten. And I think that the people that recognize how dangerous he is as a human being, the smartest people, will organize together and they will work on ejecting him. Yeah, let's office. talk about the Democrats now, because we've got a very important signal from London, from the elections in England. Uh, Corbyn basically was hugely defeated. People say that because he was so much on the left, uh, basically everybody ended up voting for Boris Johnson. Now we have two candidates that are doing very well, Elizabeth Warren uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you know and, and they are all and Bernie and, you know, Sanders and so they uh, and, and Elizabeth Warren seems to be doing well. So what happens if she will get the nomination first? Do you think she can get it? And if she gets it, can she beat Trump or Trump will be reinforced by that? No. So after those Boris two, Johnson less. Those two candidates, in my opinion and I've said this consistently, they lose to, assuming that Trump makes it, and I've gotten my assessment wrong about where his polling numbers are gonna go, and he makes it, and they put up the Corbin of the US, he'll beat them by 40 states. That's my honest opinion, because the United States, like the United Kingdom, not ready for hardcore, that style of socialism. And so, Elizabeth Warren has a different thing going on, and, and, and forgive me for being so brutally honest in the room, but the American people, by and large, this is so weirdly a patriarchal society. We've advanced a tremendous amount with women's issues, and we have a Me Too movement going on right now. But I think she's also going to suffer from that headwind. And frankly, uh, I believe the Secretary Clinton suffered from that. But if the Democrats are stupid enough to give it to her or Bernie Sanders, uh, they will be destroyed in the election, very similar to uh, what happened. And so you think it would be Biden? Or what chances Bloomberg has? Okay, so I can give you the uh, Mayor Mike strategy. I'll be very quick on it. Uh, the Mayor Mike strategy is an RFK strategy. It's not a Rudy Giuliani strategy. RFK started in March, uh, and he went after the biggest states that had the largest delegates. And on June 5th of 1968, he was the presumptive nominee. He won the California primary, and unfortunately, he was assassinated after he gave his victory speech, he was walking back through the uh, kitchen and Sirhan Sirhan shot him. But Robert Kennedy's uh, strategy was to go after the 46 states. Uh, Mayor Mike is liquid. He's got up to $5 billion to spend. He's expected to spend $500 million. He's already dropped $100 million in television advertising. He's expected to spend another $400 million to put him in a pole position to be the nominee or to force a brokered convention. And so let's say he forces a brokered convention. His narrative at that convention is, I can beat President Trump. This should be about a referendum of who is best suited to beat President Trump. In addition to his moderate centrist policies and the fact that he's a capitalist, he's going to have two to three billion US dollars that he can personally spend in the election. And so his narrative is gonna be at the convention, take the DNC money, and give it to the House members and give it to the Senate members. I will finance this thing, spend three times more than Donald Trump going into November of 2020. And I think that's a pretty compelling narrative. And so he believes, and his team believes, remember they're very data-driven people. He owns, he owns one of the largest information retrieval companies in the world. And based on their data, he believes he has a 60% chance to win. I'll give you one last fact on Mike because I think this is important. The other candidates in the Democratic race are thinly financed, and they are all putting their marbles on the first four states. And one of them is hopefully trying to become the presumptive front, front runner where they can then raise capital to go after the remaining 46 states. Mike doesn't need to do that. He's already recruiting the best Democratic operatives and paying them very high salaries in those 46 states. So he is in an interesting position despite the fact that the media is not counting him in yet. And remember, Mike's an entrepreneur. He built Bloomberg from nothing, and he went through the trials and tribulations of that. So I wouldn't be marking him off of your 
uh, list at this point. I okay, think he's so a let's, very let's, formidable let's open to the to the public, and 